Step into the nostalgic world of 1980s Hollywood, where a cast of child stars once shone brightly on our screens, weaving tales of innocence and charm. Yet beyond the glamour, many of these young talents faced heart-wrenching turns in their life stories. From the glitz of fame to the shadows of personal struggles, the journeys of 1980s child stars carry poignant reminders of the challenges that accompany early stardom. Let's unravel the most tragic stories that unfolded in the lives of these once illustrious stars from the iconic 80s era. 1. Corey Haim Corey Haim, a prominent Canadian actor of the 1980s, graced the screen with memorable performances in movies like Murphy's Romance, The Lost Boys, License to Drive, Dream a Little Dream, and Lucas. Embarking on his acting journey at a young age, he garnered recognition as a promising artist with immense potential. Unfortunately, Haim's life took a tragic turn due to struggles with drug addiction, leading to his untimely demise in 2010 at the age of 38. Widely regarded as a heartthrob, he captivated audiences in the 80s with his charismatic on-screen presence and acting prowess, earning praise for portraying complex characters early in his career. Corey Ian Haim Growing up in a modest family, young Corey was initially reserved and kept to himself. In an effort to break out of his shell and boost his confidence, he turned to acting lessons, using the craft as a means to open up. As Haim explored various interests, including acting and sports, his family underwent the challenge of a divorce. Witnessing this upheaval was tough on Haim, prompting him to immerse himself in his work as a coping mechanism. The complexities of Haim's childhood were further compounded by his status as a child actor, exposing him to traumatic incidents that would significantly influence his future. Corey Haim endured multiple tragic experiences during his childhood. Feldman revealed in 2016, six years after Haim's passing, that he couldn't disclose names due to legal concerns. He emphasized that Haim faced even more severe abuse than himself and both understood the challenges they went through. In 2020, Feldman shifted his stance and accused actor Charlie Sheen of inappropriate behavior towards Haim during the filming of the 1986 movie Lucas. Feldman also claimed the involvement of other individuals. Sheen vehemently denied the allegations, stating, These are sick, twisted, and outlandish allegations never occurred. Period. Haim's mother, Judy, asserted in 2017 that actor Dominic Braschia was the one who harmed her son on the set of Lucas. What remains evident is the profound impact these experiences had on Haim's childhood. Reflecting on the abuse, Haim once expressed, I was very, very awake and very ashamed of what was going on. I have come to terms with this a long time ago, but obviously not totally. Stuff happens when you are a kid. It scars you inside for life. Corey Hom initially had little interest in pursuing an acting career. Hockey held more appeal to him, and he aspired to go professional in the sport. However, influenced by his sister's venture into auditions, Haim decided to give acting a try. Surprisingly, he quickly gained attention and secured a breakthrough role on the Canadian show The Edison Twins. Though acting wasn't his initial focus, Haim's performances garnered positive reviews. His role in Lucas, in particular, received acclaim from critic Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times, who noted, Haim does not give one of those cute little boy performances that get on your nerves. He creates one of the most three-dimensional, complicated, interesting characters of any age in any recent movie. Ebert expressed optimism about Haim's potential, asserting that if he lived up to the displayed talent, he would have a successful and enduring acting career. Haim had some early roles in films like Murphy's Romance and Secret Admirer before he embraced a particularly challenging part, marking his first leading role as a paraplegic boy in Silver Bullet. He also garnered attention for his performance in the made-for-TV film A Time to Live, earning widespread appreciation and a Young Artist of the Year award. Following this success, Haim received acclaim from Ebert for Lucas, captivating young audiences with his acting. 
A significant milestone in his career came with The Lost Boys, 1987, a film that resonated with viewers despite receiving mixed reviews from critics. The Lost Boys also marked the collaboration of Corey Feldman and Haim, leading to their recognition as The Two Corys. The partnership between Feldman and Haim extended to numerous projects as they ascended to fame early in their careers. In total, they collaborated on ten films and even ventured into the realm of reality TV with their own show. Like many stars, Corey Haim faced a challenging period, and the 1990s proved to be a difficult time for the actor as he grappled with staying relevant amid battles with drug addiction. Despite working on projects like the video game Double Switch, he struggled to find stability and ultimately declared bankruptcy in 1997. As the 2000s unfolded, Haim made efforts to rebuild his life and overcome his substance abuse issues. Unfortunately, he found himself entangled with prescription drugs. Reflecting on his journey, Haim admitted, I started on the downers, which were a hell of a lot better than the uppers, because I was a nervous wreck. But one led to two, two led to four, four led to eight, until at the end it was about 85 a day. The doctors could not believe I was taking that much, and that was just the Valium. I'm not talking about the other pills I went through. Haim's struggle with substance abuse spanned a significant period, starting from his early days, with initial experimentation during the filming of Lucas, evolving into a complex battle to control his addiction to various substances. Corey Haim made sincere efforts to confront his addiction problems. Despite hard work in seeking recovery through rehab and attempting to break free from the grip of drugs, he found himself trapped in a relentless cycle of relapses. In 1989, Haim took a unique approach by creating a film titled Corey Haim, Me, Myself, and I, addressing the rumors surrounding his drug addiction. In the film, he aimed to connect with his fans and openly discuss his struggles. Looking to the future, he expressed hope, saying, Ten years from now, I'm hopefully going to be in Tahiti or something, kicking back like in my huge mansion, if everything goes right. It's all up to me. Despite his continuous battles and multiple returns to rehab, Haim faced challenges. Biography notes that his reliance on prescription drugs led to significant weight gain, and he reportedly suffered a stroke. Haim's mother attempted to redirect his path by encouraging him to move to Toronto and distance himself from Hollywood. In 2004, a song titled Whatever Happened to Corey Haim by The Thrills caught his attention. Although not directly connected to the actor, he responded stating, I'm clean, sober, humble, and happy. According to Corey Feldman, both he and Haim felt mistreated by others in the industry, with Feldman suggesting that the publicity surrounding their drug use was an excuse to push them out of the limelight. In his later years, Corey Haim often found himself in solitude. His once close relationship with Feldman had strained due to Haim's struggles with addiction, an unfortunate incident where Haim appeared on set under the influence led Feldman to decide it wasn't suitable for the actor to be around his family. In response, Haim expressed his feelings in 2008, stating, I will always love Corey Feldman, but I lost 105% respect for him and his wife. By 2010, a neighbor observed that while Haim may have appeared healthier, he seemed lonely, frequently seen in public, looking for companionship, looking for friends. In 2010, Corey Feldman spoke passionately about his friend, criticizing those who hadn't supported Haim in the last 15 years of his life. He questioned, where were all these people to lend a hand out, to reach out to him and say, you know, you're a legend, you're an amazingly talented, wonderful person who's really never gone out of his way to hurt anybody other than himself. Unfortunately, Corey Haim's romantic relationships were also challenging. One of his exes, actress Alyssa Milano, revealed that she tried to support him and get him the help he needed, but her efforts proved futile. 
Despite early success in his acting career, Corey Haim faced financial struggles towards the end of his life. E. Online reported that his drug addiction had depleted his finances. In 1997, when Haim filed for bankruptcy, his assets were meager, including a 10-year-old BMW, $100 in cash, and royalties valued at around $7,500. These limited resources were far from enough to secure any financial stability. By 2010, Heim's challenging circumstances led to his funeral expenses being covered by a celebrity memorabilia organization. Despite attempts to revive his career, he couldn't recover financially. In a desperate move in 2001, he even tried to auction his hair and teeth on eBay, but the auctions were taken down due to violations of the website's policies prohibiting the sale of body parts. Corey Haim grappled with drug addiction for a significant portion of his life, even attempting to kill himself through drug overdose on multiple occasions. Corey Feldman, his longtime friend, acknowledged Haim's struggles and the intentional overdoses, emphasizing Haim's continuous effort to be the best person he could be. Feldman recounted an alarming incident where he discovered Haim foaming at the mouth due to an overdose, intervening to save him by administering charcoal. In his final days, Haim was unwell, battling a bout of flu while residing with his mother. Following his passing, speculation arose, with rumors circulating about suicide or a drug overdose. These speculations were later debunked. The unexpected death of Corey Haim in 2010 left many in shock and sadness. According to CNN, paramedics were called to Haim's apartment in the early morning hours of March 10th after he felt dizzy and became unresponsive. While no illegal drugs were found, there were a few prescription medicines. Corey Feldman shared his emotional reaction to the news, expressing that tears started streaming down his face as he learned about his friend's passing. He emphasized the importance of learning from Haim's experience and treating people with kindness while they are still alive. Feldman hoped that Corey's artistic legacy would be remembered as the true reflection of his passion. Subsequently, it was disclosed that Haim's cause of death was pneumonia and other natural causes, dispelling any notion of an overdose. Haim had expressed his determination to overcome challenges, stating a few years before his death, You've got to walk through the raindrops, and that's what I'm trying to do. Fans paid tribute to the actor on social media, creating Facebook groups in his memory and expressing their love for films like The Lost Boys. 2. River Phoenix In the late 80s and early 90s, River Phoenix stood out as one of the most sought-after young actors in Hollywood. His journey into acting began in childhood, but it was his breakout role in the 1986 film Stand By Me that propelled him into stardom. At the age of 18, he garnered Golden Globe and Academy Award nominations for his performance in Running on Empty in 1988. Phoenix continued to leave his mark on Hollywood, featuring in notable films such as Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, 1989, My Own Private Idaho, 1991, and Sneakers, 1992. By October 1993, he was set to starve in dark blood and interview with the vampire. However, the promising actor's career was tragically cut short on October 31, 1993, when Phoenix collapsed outside the popular West Hollywood nightclub, The Viper Room, succumbing to a drug overdose. River came into the world as River Jude Bottom, born in a log cabin in Oregon to his hippie parents. Inspired by Herman Hesse's philosophical novel, Siddhartha, they named him after a meaningful river, while Jude was a nod to the Beatles song. His four siblings, each with unique names like Rain, Joaquin, Liberty, and Summer, followed, but their upbringing was notably challenging. At the tender age of two, River's parents joined the Children of God, a group of nomadic hippies rejecting the capitalist system and labeling adherents as systemites. In this unconventional lifestyle, adults didn't work and children didn't attend school, including River and his siblings. Recalling those times, River mentioned singing at jails with his sister and distributing literature with uplifting messages. To make ends meet, 
He even played his guitar on the streets. Essentially, River and his family were part of a religious cult. Similar to many cults of that era, they lived in communes and fervently believed in an impending apocalypse. The cult gained notoriety due to controversial practices, including allegations of child sexual abuse, implicating the cult's founder, David Brant Berg, who faced accusations of mistreating his own daughters and granddaughters. The Children of God was notorious for a practice called flirty fishing, where female members sought to recruit men by offering their bodies. This controversial practice played a role in convincing Rivers' parents to leave the cult, a decision he later labeled as morally sound, deeming the group disgusting. While leaving the cult was the right moral and spiritual choice, it posed significant financial challenges. After discreetly leaving, the family found themselves impoverished and homeless in Caracas, Venezuela, where they had been stationed. Rivers' parents experienced profound pain and loneliness after departing the once welcoming cult, residing in a beach hut for several months before hitching a ride to Florida on a commercial freighter. It was during this period that the family opted to change their surname to Phoenix, symbolizing a triumphant emergence from their prolonged struggles and aspirations for a brighter future. This symbolic rebirth seemed to resonate as life improved upon their return to the United States. River recalled affluent children donating their old clothes, and he and his sister began winning local talent contests. Their achievements caught the attention of Paramount Pictures in Hollywood after being featured in newspapers. The studio reached out to the Phoenix family, inviting them to drop by. In response, River's parents packed everyone into a station wagon and headed to Hollywood. In Los Angeles, River's mother secured a job at NBC, while River and Joaquin showcased their talents on the streets, catching the eye of acting agent Iris Burton. Impressed by the children, Burton signed them on as clients, leading River to secure roles in commercials, the short-lived CBS musical Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, and various made-for-TV movies. The turning point in River's career arrived in 1986, when he landed a role in the critically acclaimed Stand By Me. Will Wheaton, River's co-star, credited the film's success to the exceptional casting and developed a close bond with River during filming, describing him as one of the kindest people I'd ever been around. This role catapulted River to stardom, aligning with the metaphorical significance of his surname. He became a prominent advocate for animal rights and environmental awareness. Despite his fame, River grappled with the pressures of being a symbol for positive causes. Posthumously, his mother revealed to Esquire that he became increasingly uncomfortable with being the face of all things good, expressing a desire for anonymity that was never fulfilled. Financial success brought its own challenges, and River assumed a paternal role in the family, especially given his father's struggle with alcoholism. As the eldest and most successful child, he felt a responsibility to provide for his family. Samantha Mathis, River's girlfriend and fellow actor, recounted a poignant moment in their last year together when River shared, I just have to make one more movie to put away enough money so my youngest sister can go to college. This statement encapsulates River's generosity and maturity. Tragically, River passed away in the early hours of October 31, 1993, at the tender age of 23. While the details surrounding his death vary, it is known that River succumbed to a dangerous combination of cocaine and heroin, commonly referred to as a speedball. The autopsy report indicated an absence of drugs in his nasal passages or needle tracks, suggesting that River may have ingested the concoction as a drink. Shockingly, his bloodstream revealed a concentration of the substances at eight times the lethal dosage. Accounts of that fateful night align with the autopsy findings. River had visited the Viper Room, a Hollywood club owned by Johnny Depp, accompanied by Red Hot Chili Peppers guitarist John Frusciante. Director William Richard recounted Samantha Mathis informing him that Frusciante offered River a cup, urging him to drink it with the promise that he'd feel fabulous. 
Whether intended for sipping or sharing, River chose to consume the entire cup. Subsequently, he experienced tremors, collapsed, and was observed stumbling around the bar. Musician Bob Forrest recalled River tapping him on the shoulder, revealing he believed he was overdosing. Frusciante reportedly isolated himself after River's death, fearing potential legal consequences. River's father expressed strong resentment, stating he would harm Frusciante if he ever encountered him. However, River's mother later clarified that the family opted not to pursue legal action. However, in a 2018 interview with The Guardian, Matisse disclosed that she was in the bathroom when River took the fatal dose. She stated, I have my suspicions about what was going on, but I didn't see anything. Upon returning, Matis found River in a confrontation with another patron. Both were ejected by a bouncer, and River began convulsing. Regardless of the specifics that night, the outcome remained unchanged. River suffered an overdose, witnessed by his family and girlfriend. Joaquin Phoenix dialed 911, and Rain attempted resuscitation. Although he remained alive when the ambulance arrived, River was later pronounced dead at Cedars Sinai Hospital. It was an undeniably tragic end for River, capping a life marked by adversity. He is remembered today as a beautiful soul who struggled to overcome misfortune and was taken from us far too soon. 3. Todd Bridges Todd Bridges began his career as a child actor on the widely popular NBC sitcom Different Strokes, which aired from the late 70s to the mid-80s. As the series concluded, the show's main actors, Gary Coleman and Bridges, had become significant stars. The show, revolving around two black orphans, Arnold and Willis Jackson, taken in by a wealthy white businessman, spanned eight seasons. Bridges, at just 13 years old, became known for the show's iconic line, What you talking about, Willis? Despite the promising future that awaited him at the show's end when Bridges was 20, he reportedly struggled with addiction, significantly impacting his acting opportunities. The conclusion of the series marked a pivotal turn in his life. Alongside battling drug addiction, Bridges faced legal issues, including arrests, jail time, and even charges of attempted murder. Todd Bridges faced a series of tragedies that began when he was just 15 years old, a few years into his role as Willis. According to Oprah, around that time, he started using drugs as a way to cope with being a victim of alleged abuse. At the age of 11, Bridges claimed he was repeatedly attacked by an older man who was a family friend. During one incident, Bridges defended himself physically, leading his mother to confront the alleged predator. While his mother reacted immediately to the assault, his father did not, creating a fracture in the security Bridges felt with him, impacting him later in life. While different strokes was still on the air, Bridges had a brush with the law, resulting in his arrest and a fine in 1983 for carrying a concealed weapon. After the show concluded, Bridges struggled with persistent and escalating drug addiction. Reportedly, he also became involved in dealing, engaging in the sale of both cocaine and meth. In 1987, he faced charges of robbery and making threats, further complicating his challenges during this period. Todd Bridges faced additional challenges beyond his legal issues. In 1989, he found himself entangled in more legal troubles connected to his reported addiction. That year, he was charged with the attempted murder of another drug dealer. In May 1990, Bridges was incarcerated on suspicion of drug possession, and a few months later, he was acquitted of the murder charge. His alleged addiction and repeated arrests took a toll on the young actor. By 1992, at the age of 26, Bridges reached a breaking point, hitting rock bottom. In his autobiography, he revealed contemplated suicide by a cop after being pulled over. Bridges confessed that he had grown weary of his tumultuous life and saw this drastic method as an escape. The book delves into his mental state and the profound exhaustion he was experiencing. I was worn out. It had been a long time coming. I'd been using and dealing on and off for six years, and even though I'd been trying to get my act cleaned up, 
it clearly wasn't working, wrote Bridges. A judge mandated a 90-day psychological study, a sentence that likely played a crucial role in turning his life around. Subsequently, the actor achieved sobriety and has remained clean for well over two decades now. Todd Bridges experienced a life-altering moment when he decided to overcome his drug addiction. The judge's compassionate stance, refraining from penalizing Bridges for his illness, provided a valuable opportunity for the actor to turn his life around. Beyond battling addiction, Bridges had also been a victim of alleged abuse, adding complexity to his struggle. He had turned to drugs as a coping mechanism for the trauma he allegedly endured as a young boy. However, the temporary relief offered by drugs was outweighed by the compounded pain and suffering. In an interview, Bridges expressed, What made me stop was I got sick and tired of going through that pain and suffering. All drugs did was compound it and make it even worse. The drugs helped it temporarily, but it wasn't a long-lasting fix. That's why I had to stop. A pivotal factor in his journey to sobriety was his faith. Bridges turned to religion to seek answers, leading him to the realization that he needed to redirect the course of his life. Reflecting on this transformation, Bridges shared, listening to that inner voice that God is speaking through and realizing that I had choices to make. Most of them were about straightening out my life and getting my life together. After his time in prison and achieving sobriety, Todd Bridges successfully re-entered the acting scene, taking on various small roles in television shows. His career included appearances on reality TV shows, recurring roles in series like The Young and the Restless and Everybody Hates Chris, and even venturing into production and direction with the biographical film Building Bridges. Despite his professional successes, Bridges faced additional personal tragedies, particularly the untimely deaths of his former Different Strokes cast members. At 56 years old, he stands as the sole surviving member of the original cast. The first devastating loss was Dana Plato, the actress who portrayed his adoptive sister on the show. In 1999, she died at the age of 34 in what was deemed an apparent suicide. Another blow came in March 2010 when Bridges lost his close friend and actor, Corey Haim, who passed away at 38. Bridges revealed on the Today Show that he had made several attempts to help Haim overcome his struggles with addiction. Todd Bridges' life after different strokes was marked by the challenges of drug addiction and the ensuing legal troubles. In a 2013 interview with Katie Couric, Bridges revealed that his descent into addiction wasn't fueled by recreational use, but rather by a need for self-medication. He attributed the start of his drug use to the desire to mask the pain and suffering he witnessed within his family, particularly instances of abuse against his mother. Recalling a traumatic incident where he reported an assault by an older man, Bridges shared the heartbreaking revelation that his father sided with the alleged abuser, leaving him devastated as a child. That just destroyed me because the guy who was supposed to protect me didn't protect me, Bridges expressed. So when I found drugs, what happened was it covered up the pain and suffering. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic abuse, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. Additional information, resources, and support can be found on their website. 4. Shannon Doherty Shannon Doherty, a prominent TV star from the controversial 1990s era, is more than just the polarizing figure many love to criticize. With a career that kicked off in 1982 as a child star, this Memphis, Tennessee native gained early recognition with a recurring role on Little House on the Prairie. However, it was the teenage sensation, Beverly Hills 902 that catapulted her to fame at the age of 19. Following this success, her starring role in the hit TV series Charmed from 1998 to 2001 marked another significant milestone in her career, complementing over 80 other credits on her extensive resume. While Doherty's enduring talent has sustained her in the entertainment industry, 
Her notoriety as a bad girl in the early days of her career contributed to her heightened fame. Frequently making headlines for her hard partying lifestyle, onset conflicts, tumultuous romances, and occasional perceived attitude issues, Doherty reflected on this period in an interview with Parade, noting the irony that such behavior might not garner the same attention today. Nevertheless, Doherty emphasizes that she has learned and grown from her experiences, shaping her into the resilient woman she is today. Despite the challenges, she has faced her fair share of life's hardships. Shannon Doherty faced significant challenges in Hollywood, earning a reputation for being difficult to work with, particularly during her Beverly Hills 902 Canso days. This period marked her initial notoriety for on-set conflicts and unprofessional behavior. While Doherty has taken responsibility for her past mistakes, she attributes much of her tumultuous behavior to struggles in her personal life as a young adult, acknowledging that a considerable portion of it was rooted in misunderstanding. The tabloids played a role in exacerbating the situation, with Doherty revealing that many reports about her were either exaggerated or entirely false. In an interview, she expressed the difficulty of dealing with constant misinformation, noting the absence of social media at the time, which prevented her from addressing false narratives about herself. The negative attention likely contributed to missed acting opportunities for Doherty, impacting her career despite her talent. Tori Spelling, her former co-star, highlighted the unfairness of the situation, explaining that the labeling of Doherty had enduring consequences throughout her career. The 1990s posed significant challenges for Shannon Doherty, and in 1993, she faced the difficulties of being in a toxic relationship. At the age of 21, the Our House star was briefly engaged to Dean J. Factor, the heir to the makeup brand Max Factor. However, their romance took a disastrous turn, leading Factor to obtain a restraining order against Doherty. Court documents detailed alarming accusations, including threats with a gun, an attempt to run him over with a car, and throwing a log through his home window. Doherty vehemently denied being a violent person, with her father asserting that she was the actual victim of physical abuse by Factor. He claimed that Doherty returned home with a black eye after a trip with Factor, alleging he was responsible. Despite Factor's denial, the two reached a legal agreement. Nevertheless, the fallout damaged Doherty's reputation, leading to sensationalized headlines branding her as out of control. While Doherty didn't openly discuss personal experiences with domestic violence, she later collaborated with a charity supporting survivors. In 2010, she hosted the annual Artists Against Abuse Gala, expressing her honor in supporting an organization dedicated to prevention and counseling for women and working towards ending domestic abuse. Being a Hollywood bad girl is one thing, but Shannon Doherty found herself in trouble with the law on more than one occasion. It all began in 1993 when the then 21-year-old Doherty was cited for misdemeanor battery, reportedly involved in a nightclub altercation with another actor. In 1996, another arrest followed, this time for vandalism, as she was accused of throwing a beer bottle at a car outside a bar. While these encounters with the law didn't bode well for Doherty and her already tarnished reputation, her next arrest in 2000 had a profound impact. She spent several hours in jail after being arrested for drunk driving. Reflecting on the experience, she described it as one of the most humiliating, degrading experiences you can ever go through, acknowledging its impact on her career and self-perception. In response to her drunk driving arrest, Doherty engaged in community service, picking up trash and cautioning teens about the perils of drunk driving. Despite expressing regret for her decision to drive after consuming alcohol, she denied having a drinking problem. However, she revealed a personal connection to alcoholism through her husband's attendance at AA meetings, though she herself never attended for her own reasons. In 2018, Shannon Doherty, 
faced an unexpected setback when her home was engulfed in the Woosley fires, devastating Southern California and claiming thousands of structures, including Doherty's Malibu residence. The loss went beyond material possessions. As the house held cherished memories for Doherty, it was where she got married in 2011 and found solace after her father's passing. Expressing her devastation on Instagram, she wrote, It's the place I felt my dad with me. It's gone. I'm devastated by all that's happening. My heart is ripped apart. Despite the profound loss, Doherty was thankfully not at home during the fires, avoiding injury. Her pets were also safely evacuated by friends. Grateful for the safety of her loved ones, dogs, and horses, she expressed her thanks in another Instagram post, acknowledging, I'm so grateful that the people I love are safe, and my dogs and horse are safe. Doherty extended her appreciation to the firefighters and offered prayers to those who suffered losses. The aftermath of the blaze continued for Doherty, as she publicly confronted her insurance company State Farm, which initially refused to cover the repairs to her home. In 2021, after a legal battle, she was finally awarded over $6.3 million in damages. Shannon Doherty has faced significant health challenges over the years, and these struggles undoubtedly took a toll on the North Shore star. In 2015, at the age of 44, Doherty revealed that she was battling breast cancer, which had spread to her lymph nodes. While the diagnosis was devastating, what scared her the most was the uncertainty surrounding her treatment's success and the fear of a recurrence. Expressing her concerns, she questioned, Is the chemo going to work? You know, am I going to have to go through this again? Or am I going to get secondary cancer? Managing the pain, Doherty found certain aspects of the journey particularly traumatic, such as obtaining a new bra after a mastectomy and losing her hair, both of which brought her to tears. Although her cancer went into remission in 2017, she admitted on Good Morning America that the fear of a potential return lingered. Despite the challenges, Doherty sought a positive perspective, stating, it made me a better human being. It takes down all your walls, all your barriers, everything that life sort of threw at you. Cancer, however, was not her only health concern, as she had disclosed in 1999 that she suffered from the inflammatory bowel disorder, Crohn's disease. Despite its impact on her life, Doherty had been less open about this diagnosis due to the stigma associated with discussing symptoms related to bathroom habits, which she found embarrassing and unsexy to share with others. Shannon Doherty's love life has been marked by unfortunate twists, encompassing two failed engagements and three marriages that ultimately ended in divorce. The defunct actor experienced her first engagement at the age of 20 in 1991 with real estate manager Chris Fufas. However, the engagement was short-lived, and by 1993, she found herself accepting a proposal from Max Factor's heir, Dean J. Factor, which, as previously mentioned, didn't lead to a happy ending. Shortly thereafter, she entered her first marriage with actor Ashley Hamilton, but by 1994, they were divorced. In 2002, Doherty's path to marital bliss took another turn when she wed Rick Salomon, known for his infamous 2004 sex tape with Paris Hilton. Although Doherty annulled their marriage before the scandal erupted, she later expressed her embarrassment, stating to the Chicago Tribune, It ended up being very embarrassing for me. Reflecting on her choices in men, she admitted to Parade, It's like, why did I pick these men? I guess it was about what I thought I could do to help them. By 2011, it seemed that Doherty had finally found happiness in her marriage to photographer Curtis Warienko. She praised his support during her battle with cancer. However, in a surprising turn of events, she announced their split in April 2023, hinting at infidelity by stating through her publicist that his agent was intimately involved. In November 2023, Shannon Doherty shared heartbreaking news regarding her battle with breast cancer. 
In an exclusive interview with People, she revealed that the cancer had spread to her bones. Despite the challenging circumstances, Doherty expressed a strong determination to continue living, loving, creating, and making positive changes. She emphasized, I'm not done with hopefully changing things for the better. While the update on her health was undoubtedly difficult, bone metastasis is a relatively common occurrence in breast cancer, with around half of those experiencing metastasis encountering it in the bones first, as reported by Susan G. Komen. This form of metastasis can bring about an increased risk of pain, bone fractures, and reduced mobility. Despite the diagnosis, Daugherty remains committed to making a meaningful impact. In December 2023, she launched a new podcast titled Let's Be Clear with Shannon Daugherty. Reflecting on her changed perspective due to the cancer, she shared with people, I know it sounds cheesy and crazy, but you're just more aware of everything and you feel so blessed. We're the people who want to work the most because we're just so grateful for every second, every hour, every day we get to be here. 5. Judith Barcy On the surface, Judith Barcy appeared to have it all. At just 10 years old, she had already secured numerous film and TV roles, including appearances in Cheers and Jaws, The Revenge, as well as lending her voice to animated movies like The Land Before Time. However, beneath her rising star was a tragic story that ultimately led to her untimely death. From the very start, Judith Eva Barsi appeared destined for a life distinct from her parents. Born on June 6, 1978, in sunny Los Angeles, California, she stood in contrast to her parents, Joseph Barsi and Maria Virovach Barsi, who had individually escaped the 1956 Soviet occupation of their native Hungary. Maria, captivated by the stars in nearby Hollywood, was resolute in steering her daughter toward a career in acting. She imparted lessons to Judith on posture, poise, and elocution. Maria Barsi's brother, Joseph Weldon, recalled, I said I wouldn't waste my time. I told her the chances are one in 10,000 that she would succeed. Yet in a stroke of Hollywood enchantment, Maria defied the odds. In typical Los Angeles fashion, where something is always in the making, Judith Barcy caught the eye of a crew at an ice rink. Mesmerized by the petite blonde effortlessly gliding on the ice, they extended an invitation for her to join their commercial. Subsequently, Judith's journey as an actress flourished. She graced numerous commercials, appeared on popular TV shows like Cheers, and secured roles in films such as Jaws, The Revenge. Eerily, Judith portrayed a daughter murdered by her father in the 1984 miniseries Fatal Vision. Her petite stature captivated casting directors, enabling her to portray younger characters. So diminutive was Judith that she underwent hormone injections to aid her growth. At 10, she was still playing 7, 8, recounted her agent, Ruth Hansen. Judith Barcy, she emphasized, was a happy, bubbly little girl. Judith's triumphs translated into prosperity for her family, earning approximately $100,000 annually. Her parents invested in a three-bedroom house at 22 100 McCall Street in the Canoga Park neighborhood, marking the western edge of the San Fernando Valley. Maria's grandest aspirations appeared to be materializing, and Judith seemed destined for triumph. However, Judith's father, Joseph Barsi, cast a somber shadow over her childhood. As Judith Barcy's stardom ascended, her domestic life descended into darkness. Beyond the glittering spotlight, Judith and Maria Virovax Barcy faced assaults at the hands of Joseph. A heavy drinker prone to anger, Joseph directed his rage toward his wife and daughter. Threats to kill Maria and even Judith, ensuring Maria's suffering became disturbingly commonplace. Peter Kivlin, a friend of Joseph, recounted numerous instances where Joseph expressed his desire to end his wife's life. Kivlin attempted to reason with him, questioning the fate of his little one if he followed through. Joseph's bone-chilling response, as relayed by Kivlin, was, I gotta kill her too. During one incident, Joseph forcibly took a kite from Judith. When she feared he would destroy it, 
He labeled his daughter a spoiled brat who didn't understand sharing and shattered the kite into pieces. On another occasion, as Judith prepared to depart for the Bahamas to film Jaws, the revenge, Yosef menaced her with a knife. His ominous words were, If you decide not to come back, I will cut your throat. Joseph Weldon, Maria Barsi's brother, recalled an unsettling conversation he overheard between father and daughter during Judith and Maria's visit to him in New York. Yosef, he claimed, warned Judith, Remember what I told you before you left, leaving Judith in tears. Before long, Judith's home turmoil started to permeate her everyday existence. She began to pluck out her own eyelashes and even her cat's whiskers. Expressing her fear of returning home, Judith confided in friends, stating, My daddy is drunk every day, and I know he wants to kill my mother. Just before a crucial audition in May 1988, she experienced a breakdown that deeply concerned her agent. That's when I realized how bad Judith was, recalled Hansen. She was crying hysterically, she couldn't talk. Despite Hansen's insistence that Judith Barcy consult with a child psychiatrist who promptly reported the case to the Los Angeles County Department of Children and Family Services, no meaningful change occurred. Maria hesitated to leave her home and husband, torn between fearing for her safety and reluctance to abandon the life she had built. I can't, because he'll come after us and kill us, and he's threatened to burn the house down, she confided to a neighbor. Despite Maria Barcy taking tentative steps to escape her husband's abuse, considering divorce and renting an apartment in Panorama City closer to the movie studios for a potential escape with Judith during filming, her hesitation to leave proved fatal. Around 8.30 a.m. on July 27, 1988, a neighbor of the Barcy's heard an explosion next door. My first thought, as I ran in to call 911, was, He's done it. He's killed them and set a fire in the house, just like he said he would, the neighbor recounted to the Los Angeles Times. Yosef Barsi had indeed carried out the horrific act. It appeared he had killed Judith and Maria a few days before, likely on July 25th. Police discovered Judith Barsi in her bed, while Maria Virovac Barsi was found in the hallway. Both had been shot and doused with gasoline, which Yosef ignited shortly before taking his own life in the garage. If you or someone you're aware of is facing domestic abuse, don't hesitate to reach out for help. Call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. Additional information, resources, and support can be found on their website. Although Judith Barcy passed away in July 1988, her legacy continued through her acting. Two of her animated films were released posthumously, The Land Before Time, 1988, and All Dogs Go to Heaven, 1989. In The Land Before Time, Judith lent her voice to the cheerful dinosaur Ducky, known for her signature line, Yep, 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 a phrase now inscribed on her tombstone at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Los Angeles. In All Dogs Go to Heaven, Judith portrayed Anne-Marie, an orphan with the ability to communicate with animals. The film concludes with the song Love Survives, which is dedicated to Judith's memory. However, before Judith Barcy's untimely death, her star was just beginning to rise. Bonnie Gold, the spokeswoman for Judith's acting agency, remarked, She was very successful, with every door open to her there's no telling how far she would have gone. Some claim that Judith didn't go far at all and remained in the house where she met her tragic end as a ghost. In 2020, the family who purchased the former Barcy home reported experiencing cold spots throughout the property and observed the garage door seemingly opening and closing on its own. On the show, Murder House Flip, a team undertook renovations to enhance the colors in the house and allow more natural light. Whether or not the house was ever haunted, the new owners assert that the renovations improved the overall atmosphere. Nevertheless, Judith Barcy's enduring presence is primarily felt through her films, TV shows, and commercials. 
While her on-screen appearances may evoke a sense of haunting today, they also capture the essence of Judith's undeniable talent, a spark that could have burned even brighter if not for her father's tragic actions. 6. Heather O'Rourke For many kids of Generation X, the 1982 film Poltergeist served as an introduction to the horror genre. The concept of a mischievous supernatural entity communicating with a child through a snowy television and eventually pulling her into an invisible world left a lasting impression. The movie also planted the idea that a tree outside your window or the toy clown in your room could be conduits for demonic spirits, ensuring that nightlight manufacturers of that era thrived. Among the standout elements of Steven Spielberg's classic poltergeist is the character Carol Ann Freeling, the young girl coveted by the ominous spiritual entity in the family's home. Portrayed by the cherubic Heather O'Rourke, Carol Ann played a central role in the film and its two sequels. Whether it was Carol Ann delivering the chilling line, there he airy, in front of the static-laden television, her platinum blonde hair peeking out from under a football helmet as an unseen force slid her across the kitchen floor, or O'Rourke's voice reaching out from beyond, the character left an indelible mark. The storyline also depicts Carol Ann finding the courage to go into the light to reunite with her family. In reality, however, O'Rourke did not experience a scripted happy ending. Just six years after the release of the first Poltergeist, she tragically passed away at the tender age of 12. Heather Michelle O'Rourke was born on December 27, 1975, in Santee, San Diego, California. Her parents, Kathleen, a seamstress, and Michael O'Rourke, a construction worker, provided the backdrop for her early life. Hollywood is filled with unique stories of how actors and actresses get discovered. Some climb the ladder after years in commercials or modeling, while others attend drama schools before making their way to Hollywood. Then there are those who are simply lucky. Like the legendary Mikhail Landon, discovered while working at a gas station. Heather O'Rourke's discovery story falls into a category of its own, albeit at a much younger age. The serendipity began when her older sister, Tammy, secured a role as a dancer in the film Pennies from Heaven. While waiting for Tammy, Heather and her mother found themselves having lunch at the MGM commissary, and this seemingly ordinary moment changed her life forever. During that time, Steven Spielberg was gearing up for a new horror film titled Poltergeist, and was on the lookout for a four-year-old actress to take on a significant role, some might attribute it to fate, while others might see it as a fortunate coincidence. But for Heather O'Rourke, it was an opportunity too good to be true. Heather O'Rourke skyrocketed to stardom overnight with the success of The Poltergeist, earning a nomination for Best Young Supporting Actress in a motion picture at the Young Artist Awards. Following this triumph, O'Rourke took on various roles, including a stint in the television series Happy Days, featuring in 12 episodes. The newfound success translated into increased earnings, enabling her family to move from a trailer park to a three-bedroom house in Big Bear, California. Despite her fame, it was crucial to remember that Heather, like any other child, resided in Big Bear with her family. During a 1986 interview with The Sun, when Heather was in fifth grade, she emphasized that her friends at Big Bear Elementary treated her just like any other kid. On the contrary, it was the adult fans who often requested her to deliver the famous line, they're here, when recognizing her in public. Heather shared, they'll look at me once, then they'll ask me if I was the little girl in Poltergeist or on Happy Days. If they stare at me without saying anything, then I think that something's wrong with my appearance. But then I realize they're staring at me because they recognize me. In 1986, at the age of 12, O'Rourke returned to her role in the sequel Poltergeist II, uttering the famous line, They're back this time. However, tragedy struck with the release of Poltergeist III in 1988, where Heather once again portrayed Carol Ann Freeling. Regrettably, by the time the film hit cinemas, Heather O'Rourke had passed away at the age of 12. 
Her sudden death sent shockwaves through the industry, initially shrouded in mysterious circumstances. Heather's mother, Kathleen, recounted that the first signs of illness appeared in January 1987, when Heather began experiencing nausea. Despite multiple visits to a Kaiser facility in San Diego, the medical staff repeatedly diagnosed her with the flu. As Heather's condition worsened, with swelling feet, she was eventually hospitalized for several days. Tests revealed she had a parasite named Giardia, and after receiving medication, she recovered. In June of the same year, slated to begin filming Poltergeist III in Chicago, Heather's mother Kathleen, being an overprotective mother, opted for a follow-up visit to the Kaiser Clinic for her daughter. It turned out that Heather was not as fine as they had thought. After an x-ray with that chalky white barium solution, they found that the parasite had cleared up, but there was still some inflammation. They labeled it as Crohn's and put her on cortisone and sulfa, Kathleen recounted. Despite having no symptoms, Heather went on to film Poltergeist III, and by September 1987, she was feeling fine again. To celebrate the completion of the film and Heather's well-being, they decided to take a trip to Disney World in Florida and then back to Los Angeles. Everything seemed to be going well. They had moved into a new, spacious, two-bedroom apartment in Lakeside, California, and life continued as usual. However, on January 31, 1988, Heather O'Rourke woke her mother up, feeling nauseous and choosing to stay home from school. The next day, she informed her mother that she couldn't swallow her breakfast. Then I noticed her fingers and toes turning blue, and she began to breathe heavily, kind of fast. Her stomach was distended. I immediately called our local doctor, and his office instructed, bring her right in. About 20 seconds later, she collapsed to the floor. That's when I called the paramedics, Kathleen recalled. Heather was suffering from septic shock. When the paramedics arrived, she was still conscious, and on the way to the ambulance, Kathleen expressed her love to her daughter. I love you too, Heather replied, which happened to be her final words. While en route to the hospital, Heather O'Rourke experienced cardiac arrest. Despite the paramedics' efforts to revive her, it proved unsuccessful. She passed away during surgery at the age of 12. The funeral took place on February 5th, 1988 in Los Angeles. In May of 1988, the Los Angeles Times reported that O'Rourke's mother filed a wrongful death lawsuit against her daughter's doctors for misdiagnosing her. The real cause of death, intestinal stenosis, a condition O'Rourke was born with, could have been treated with surgery if known, potentially saving her life. The lawsuit was settled out of court. Now, we'd love to hear from all of you. Who was your favorite child star among those we highlighted? And who do you think handled the immense fame the best? Did we overlook someone who should have been on this list? Share your thoughts in the comments and let us know your opinions on all these incredibly memorable child stars. If you enjoyed our compilation, please give this video a thumbs up. It truly makes a difference. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you never miss a beat. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, goodbye for now.